Good morning and welcome to our worship service from North Timoth Community Church. Our theme today is what does love really look like? And we'll be uh, looking at Romans chapter 12 verses 9 to 21. At our present time, it appears that evil, hatred and lies dominate our world. From terror organisations that use violence and propaganda to achieve their ends, to polarised party politics, where power seems to be the only thing that matters, and honesty, integrity and the truth are casualties. Of course, added to all these woes, we have the devastating effects of the global pandemic on governments, health services, businesses, livelihoods, families and individual lives. In this difficult and rapidly changing situation, where we find it hard to get our bearings or to understand what is really going on, we need to turn our eyes upon Jesus, who is the same yesterday, today and forever, in order to gain the stability and confidence that we need. The world in biblical times was no better or easier than our present world, and Christ's teaching and example are as relevant now as then. He has left us his word, his Holy Spirit, and the support of our fellow believers to help us face the challenges of this world and be more than conquerors in the battle against sin and evil. Jesus still teaches us that the greatest command is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength and to love our neighbour as ourselves. And Paul still tells us that whatever are our gifts or achievements in this world, without love, we are simply a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. So today, we are going to look at the Bible's view on love from Paul's letter to the Romans, which describes both loving attitudes and loving actions. We will try and answer the question, what does love really look like? So if you would like to turn to Romans chapter 12, we'll start at verse 9, and I'm reading from the NIV. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Shall we pray? 
Lord, we thank you for your love and goodness to us. And we thank you for the precious gift of our Lord Jesus Christ to be our Saviour and our Lord. <clears throat> thank you for the word that we have just read from Romans. And we pray, Lord, that by your Spirit, you will open our minds and open our hearts to all that you want to say to us about this very important vital subject, love. Help us to see new things, Lord, uh, um, from this familiar passage. In Jesus' name, Amen. <clears throat> love must be sincere. Most of us have learned to be nice to other people not to offend others, to act sympathetically when someone has a problem, or indignantly when they suffer injustice. But God calls us to a love that is genuine and goes well beyond pretense or politeness, involving kindness, compassion and self-giving to help others in need. We must demonstrate our loving feelings by our loving actions. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. True love is honouring to God. People often say it can't be wrong if two people love each other, but if the love concerned is not righteous in God's eyes, then it can be wrong. What sinful man calls love can be the very opposite causing more harm than good. The passage on love in 1 Corinthians 13 makes a similar point. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Again, linking love to goodness and truth. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honour one another above yourselves. In John 13, Jesus gives us a new command that we should love one another as he has loved us, which of course is with his own agape love. Paul echoes this with the words, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. We are to love each other as Christ loved us, that is, unconditionally and sacrificially. Also, we are to honour one another above ourselves. But we can, other, uh, we can honour other people for the wrong reasons, for what we hope to get out of them, such as honouring our boss in order to get a pay rise. But here we are to honour our fellow Christians because they are made in God's image, our spiritual brothers and sisters, and each has a unique and special role in the body of Christ and in God's purposes. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Sharing with those in need was one of the first ministries of the early church after the day of Pentecost. And we are still called to this today. As the Apostle John says, if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Hospitality is not the same as social entertaining. In the latter, the hosts are the focus. A beautiful home, excellent food and drink, and charming hosts. But hospitality has the needs of the guests at heart and can be practised even in the poorest homes, as in the third world, where the level of hospitality is often astonishing and humbling. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Some religions aim to stay aloof from the world's suffering, but not Christianity. Jesus felt great sympathy, both for the crowd and for individuals, and treated people 
with kindness and compassion. We are to sympathise with others, feeling their joys and sorrows, sharing in their rejoicing and mourning, and where necessary, offering them emotional and practical support. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. The religious leaders of Jesus' day were proud and self-righteous and looked down on the ordinary people. We are to be the very opposite of this, humble in heart and the friend of sinners and the poor. The sin of pride was implicated in both the fall of Satan and the fall of mankind, desiring to be our own God rather than trusting, obeying the true God. Pride is also the enemy of loving relationships because the proud person thinks too highly of themselves and too little of others to really love them, which again is the opposite of a humble, uh, loving attitude. Live in harmony with one another. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. We are to endeavour to live in harmony and peace with our fellow Christians, with our neighbours, and even with our enemies. To enable this, Jesus has given us his peace that the world cannot give. When we feel anxious, we can pray to God about our concerns and will receive the peace of God that passes all understanding. Finally, the Holy Spirit produces the fruit of peace within us, along with love and joy, etc. But we too must strive to maintain the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace and try our utmost to live in harmony with others. In Colossians 3, Paul tells us, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgiveness is central to the gospel message that Christ gave his life that we might be forgiven our sins and reconciled to God. In turn, Christ requires us to forgive others, not seven times, but 70 times seven. In Matthew 6, Jesus tells us, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive them their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. If we are unwilling to forgive, then we will end up hurting ourselves even more than others and will forfeit the peace of mind that comes from knowing God's forgiveness. However, if we are truly willing to forgive and to let go of our resentment, forgiving from the heart, then we are released from the slavery and bitterness of unforgiveness and are free once again to live in harmony with one another. Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, came to bring us peace with God, peace with one another, and last but not least, peace with ourselves. This, I think, is the very definition of shalom. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Do not repay evil for evil. Do not take revenge, my friends. In Matthew 5, Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Paul's teaching is no less radical. And here he gives it in three different ways in order to emphasise its importance. We are left in no doubt by Jesus or Paul that God requires us not only to love those who love us, but also to love our enemies. However, this goes right against our sinful human nature, which desires revenge. Also, our sense of justice cries out to God against the evil that has been done to us. I am sure that Paul knew these feelings, but nevertheless, 
he tells us not to take revenge, but to leave room for God's wrath, because it is God's business and not ours to avenge any wrong. We can be sure that God hates evil and injustice far more than we do, and he has all the necessary wisdom and love to judge fairly. But if we decide to take revenge ourselves, not seeing or understanding the overall picture like God does, then we run the risk of judging others quite wrongly or unfairly, and hence becoming as guilty as our enemies. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Not only are we told not to repay evil for evil and not to take revenge, but now we're encouraged to actively love our enemies by doing good to them when they need our help. This is consistent with the golden rule in Matthew 7. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. For many of us, doing good to those that have harmed us seems one step too far. And so it is if we rely only on our own strength and ability. The challenge of Christ and of Paul to love our enemies can only be met with the help of the Holy Spirit to pour God's love into our hearts and to give us the grace to forgive. But to encourage ourselves to forgive others, we should consider what we would like others to do for us if we were the person in need of forgiveness or help, and then act accordingly. Also, by loving our enemies, we may succeed in breaking the cycle of resentment, resentment and retaliation that ruins many relationships. Then, by God's grace, our enemies may feel shame for what they have done and eventually become our friends or even our fellow believers. This might seem impossible to us, but God specialises in the impossible. Such miracles certainly occurred in the Bible. For example, in the amazing conversion of Paul and of the Philippian jailer, and they can still happen today if we are willing to show grace and mercy to others, even when they have hurt us. Do not over be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. As was suggested in our introduction, it may seem that evil, hatred and lies are gaining ground in our world and that the devil and the forces of evil are gradually winning the spiritual battle. But this is not the case. God is still God, the supreme, supreme being and creator of the universe. He remains seated on high in all his holiness, power and majesty, and he is still active, doing good and showing love in this world by his Holy Spirit and through his people. Though the qualities of goodness, love and truth may seem weak or fragile to us, they are in reality more powerful than evil, hatred and lies, because they are qualities of God himself and so are eternal. Long after the devil and all the forces of evil have been defeated, when Christ returns, these qualities of goodness, love and truth will remain beautiful and lasting aspects of God's new creation. So we are to overcome evil with good because in Christ, good will ultimately triumph. We ask the question, what does love really look like? Let the Apostle John give us his answer. 
This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Amen. Shall we conclude with a prayer? Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you that love is the most powerful force in the universe because it's your very nature. God is love. We thank you, Lord, that you loved us so much that you sent your only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And Lord, we thank you that your commands to us are to love God wholeheartedly and to love our neighbour as ourself. Lord, love is the most important thing, but we recognise that our love is very limited and we need you to pour your love into our hearts and give us the power to love even our enemies. So we pray that we will stay very close to you and that we, Lord, will be a channel of your love, your joy and your peace to those around us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Shall we say the grace to each other? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.